Thank you all so much for coming to our webinar, How States Can Protect Life-Saving Antibiotics. My name is Danielle Malgar. I am a food and agriculture advocate with PERG, the Public Interest Research Group. Um, and we are here today to talk about effective state-level policy to reduce antibiotics overuse. Roughly two-thirds of medically important antibiotics sold in the U.S. go to farms, which contributes to the problem of antibiotic resistance, which is, of course, a major public health threat. So today, we'll hear from a few different speakers. First, we'll have um, Dr. Samir Patel, an antimicrobial stewardship program director at uh, Anne and Robert H. Lurie Children's Hospital of Chicago. We'll also hear from Madeline Clevin, Safe and Healthy Food Program Associate from the Food Animal Concerns Trust. We will hear from Raya Carr, Events and Project Coordinator and Shepherdess at Mint Creek Farm. And finally, we'll hear from my colleague, Matt Wellington, the Public Health Campaigns Director with PERG. Um, so we will start with turning it over to Dr. Samir Patel. Hello, uh, thank you for your time this afternoon. Um, uh, a little bit about my background. Uh, I'm a pediatric infectious disease physician. I've been at Lurie Children's now for about 10 years and previously um, had been in New York City. Um, it, part of my job as an infectious disease doctor is to diagnose, prevent, and treat infections in children. The, the tools we use to treat infections are in bacterial infections are antibiotics. Um, these are really when they first were developed in the early 20th century were miracle medicines that essentially rendered um, a lot of conditions that, that could have been deadly treatable from pneumonia to skin infections, meningitis, et cetera. Um, unfortunately, um, what, is a, what is a miracle drug can lose its power over time because um, anti antibiotics are unique compared to other medicines is that because they're treating living organisms, those organisms can adapt and be lo no longer uh, can be treated by these antibiotics. So this is what we call antibiotic resistance. Um, this is unique to um, antibiotics um, and other antimicrobials because unlike other um, drug classes, which you can over time have things that are better or or um, have less side effects with antibiotics, it's lit it's literally the organisms are uh, outsmarting us. Um, and the way that you um, can limit the emergence of antibiotic resistance is using antibiotics um, when sparingly and judiciously. So the over the number one driver of antibiotic use is antibiotic overuse. So um, what I do at my hospital is I'm in charge of overseeing um, measures to promote judicious use. So uh, we monitor our uh, rates of antibiotic use. We work with our various physician and nursing and pharmacy colleagues to make best policies of antibiotic use. Um, and you know we, we have interventions to see if we can reduce antibiotic safely. Uh, we track resistance um, and, and and we you know make recommendations for you know our 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 newer antibiotics to make sure that they're used only when you when you need them. As a physician, I've seen many examples of very severe antibiotic resistant infections. Uh, you know, we hope that when your child is sick, that whatever condition they have, whether they have cancer or from or have, or like a UTI, for example, that the antibiotic that I choose will be effective. But sometimes that doesn't happen. So I've seen children become very very sick from antibiotic resistant infections, including I've seen. Uh, children pass away from them, uh, and th this includes, you know, healthy children, previously healthy children, and children, you know, who have beaten cancer but have succumbed to an antibiotic-resistant infection. And this is uh, very challenging and heartbreaking. Um, now, um, the the need to promote judicious antibiotic use in the healthcare setting um, is recognized by all our public health um, uh, organizations, and it's a mandate at a federal level and um, to, to report our antibiotic use, to collect data on our use, to improve our antibiotic use and to track resistance. Um, the antibiotic use that we do in medicine um, is one important component of, of uh, limiting the emergence of antibiotic use, uh, antibiotic resistance um, in healthcare settings. But in, in our communities, it's also very important to, to limit un unnecessary antibiotic use 
in all settings, uh, not just in healthcare, uh, in our community, in our food production. Uh, because as we know from our experience with COVID, um, infectious um, conditions are not just limited to one area of the world and not just one community, they spread by nature. So whenever we promote the best use of antibiotics everywhere, we, we benefit everywhere. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Patel. Um, I will turn it over to our next speaker, uh, Madeline Clevin. And I should also say before we switch over, there will be time for Q&A at the end once all of the speakers um, have spoken. So you'll be able to add things to the Q&A and we will get to them at the end. Thanks, Danielle. Um, my name is Madeline Clevin. I'm the Safe and Healthy Food Program Associate at Food Animal Concerns Trust. FACT is a national nonprofit organization, but we're actually based in Chicago, Illinois. Um, we provide critical resources to help farmers adopt humane practices, and we also urge governmental and corporate action to reduce the threat of antibiotic resistance. I personally became interested in antibiotic resistance a few years ago when I was diagnosed with cancer, and it really opened my eyes to the invaluable nature of antibiotics. And give me a whole new perspective on the antibiotic resistance crisis. Um, so when talking about resistance, why do we focus on farms? Well, animal health is certainly not siloed from human health. Antibiotic resistant infections, like other zoonotic diseases, like COVID, spill over into the human population, but resistance via contaminated meat or the environment, where they cause difficult to treat, sometimes deadly infections in humans, and they create huge problems for adequately treating animals who are suffering with disease. That's why efforts to slow the spread of resistant superbugs and preserve our antibiotics really must be focused in large part at the nexus of human and animal health, which is animal agriculture, and more specifically, large-scale industrial farms where the vast majority of animals are raised. As Dr. Patel said, one of the primary drivers of antibiotic resistance is the overuse of antibiotics. And currently about two thirds of our medically important antibiotics are sold for use in animal production. That's because highly intensive livestock systems are often associated with factors that drive excessive and routine use of antibiotics. So these include inadequate welfare practices and high levels of disease. For instance, the majority of beef cattle are taken away from their mothers very early on. They're shipped across the country in crowded and then put in crowded facilities where they get really stressed, making them more susceptible to respiratory disease. So this is managed with routine antibiotics. Baby pigs are weaned much too early from their mothers, making them more susceptible to gastrointestinal infections, which are managed with routine antibiotics. Countries like Denmark, the Netherlands, and the UK still raise their animals in intensive systems. However, they use much less antibiotics than the US. They've really eliminated preventive uses of antibiotics. So they turn to alternatives to raise healthier animals. Alternatives to routine antibiotic use vary by disease, but often include improvements in hygiene, better vaccination, later weaning, and changes in husbandry practices. In the US, most major chicken producers have actually transitioned away from using routine medically important antibiotics, in part from market pressure exerted on suppliers from fast food chains and consumers. So really now the hope is to transition the pork and beef industries away from routine antibiotic use. Because if we don't stop using, overusing these precious medicines, they'll become less and less effective for not only people, but animals as well. Thank you. Great, thank you so much, Madeline. Uh, now we will actually hear from someone who is involved in raising animals directly and doing this without uh, the overuse of antibiotics, Raya Carr. Hi, and thanks for having me. Um, I grew up on Mint Creek Farm, which you can see in the background here. It's a 220 acre 
pasture-based farm in Ford County, Illinois. And since the early 90s, we've been raising animals on pasture. Um, we started with sheep and chickens, but when we um, began to market in Chicago, we found there's demand for beef and pork and goat and poultry as well. So we gradually expanded into sort of a Noah's Ark of a farm with all the different species of animals coexisting and rotating around the pastures. Um, and something that um, comes up for me uh, in this issue is it has to do with what the animals are eating. Because Madeline already shared a lot about the conditions they're in. Um, but, but a part of what we're up against in conventional agriculture is like with corn fed cows, for instance, um, they evolved as herbivores to eat pasture, not to eat grains. And so that, um, that makes them a lot more susceptible um, to health problems and potentially to need antibiotics. So um, kind of going in the opposite direction with the solution that farms like my family's farm have sought is, is preventative health um, through holistic uh, methods, such as rotating. If you rotate animals on pasture, it can be called holistic management. It can be called high intensity grazing or mob grazing, basically mimicking the buffalo um, or other ruminant animals and how they would uh, range, eat eat the pasture down in a specific little area, and then move on. And that prevents a lot of uh, issues with parasites and other health problems because they're not coming back to the same area where they pooped and then eating food that might be contaminated with it. Um, I mean, that, that speaks more to anti-parasitics though, um, which is something that you can prevent largely even needing if you use the kind of rotational grazing practices that a farm uh, like my family's used. But it's specifically with penicillin, which um, is a go-to on farms like ours. If you have if you have an animal that like has a wound that might be infected and they have a fever, it's like you want to be able to give them penicillin and you want to be able for it to work. And what's happened is I mean, actually just on Christmas, a lamb got its, its um, it got knocked into a panel by a group of running sheep and it kind of got its leg wedged and broken in two places. There was like a really bad break and I was giving that lamb penicillin and I went to, like I wanted the lowest possible dose for it because I knew it was gonna have to have a few rounds of antibiotics to be able to prevent infection in its broken leg. Um, but unfortunately, the amount that I had to use was about double that I wanted to use. And, and a lot of veterinarians say it's even at three or four times the dosage because of how resistant the bacteria have gotten um, to this very valuable antibiotic penicillin. And it, it's, it's pressing, like um, Dr. Patel mentioned for children, I mean, it's the same way for animals and it can be hard on their internal organs to have to give them such a high dose as well. Um, so the, the biggest, clearest message I'd like to share is just that you can prevent needing these antibiotics um, in the rotational grazing pasture-based system, which also has a myriad of positive environmental factors like fixing carbon from the um, air into the, the soil and uh, it's better for preventing erosion and cleaning the air and water, et cetera, et cetera. So I could go on and on. Um, and the uh, another piece about it, if I have time, is kind of the financial piece and profitability. Um, do I have time to talk a little bit about that? Yeah, we have a little bit of time. Yeah, go okay. ahead. Um, so that is a big challenge for small and medium sized a more holistic farms like ours trying to raise livestock specifically and with cattle and sheep, um, particularly a little bit less so with pigs because they have a shorter life cycle. You need a lot of time to for the animal to mature. I mean, with cows, it's almost two years. With sheep, it's almost a year. And it's, it's challenging from a cash flow perspective. It's also challenging from the uh, amount of land you will need in the first place. Um, so it's it's definitely, 
it's hard as a young farmer to have the resources needed to do that kind of thing. And many of the existing farms using these uh, organic and pasture-based systems have had generations of, of upon generations trying to build it up and become profitable and slowly gaining access to capital. Um, and, and so a, a challenge that we need to accelerate our tools for is how to get patient understanding capital into farms that take a few years to become profitable because you can scale and the, the demand is there from customers across the US. You have options about direct marketing or doing wholesale, but if you don't have a patient source of capital like that and one that has reasonable interest rates that aren't you know, impossible to support raising food where you don't have huge margins, you know, so that's, that's a big important piece. And it's actually, um, my, my day job is working at um, a farm, organic farmland, real estate investment trust, Iroquois Valley farmland rate. So it's been, it's been great to, you know, be able to stay involved in my family's farm, but also to be working firsthand in that finance for organic farms piece. Um, but what I see there every day is just need for more and better tools and capital for farmers, operating capital, land acquisition, et cetera. And I'll, I'll stop there. <laughs> thank you. Great, thank you so much. I think it's really helpful for everyone to hear what alternative systems could look like. Um, and then I know there's so many other related issues that we could talk about, um, but I appreciate you sharing. Uh, so I will turn it over to Matt Wellington. Hey, everybody. Uh, thanks so much for joining and thank you to our panelists. I'm, I'm glad I got to go last because it was really interesting um, hearing everybody's perspectives. And uh, yeah, so a little bit of background on me. I'm the Public Health Campaigns Director for PERG. Uh, I work with all of our state partners on health issues across the country and antibiotic resistance has been a top priority of ours for several years for all of the reasons that you've already heard um, from our other panelists. I, I don't want to pile on, but I will also say I've had personal connections to drug resistant bacteria. My, a couple of my family members um, struggled with drug resistant infections that were pretty terrifying experiences. And so I am also, as our other panelists, fully invested and fully understand the need to keep these drugs effective for the future. Um, PERG is the Public Interest Research Group or a nonpartisan uh, nonprofit advocacy organization. And one other thing I'll mention is that we uh, recently launched a new coalition called the Coalition to Preserve Antibiotics. Uh, it includes about 80 farmers like Rhea um, and physicians like Dr. Patel who are dedicated to reducing antibiotic use in agriculture as a way to keep the drugs effective. And I wanna cover just a few quick things. So I wanna reiterate why we focus on agriculture. Um, I will spend most of the time going through what the FDA, which is the agency who has authority over antibiotic use in farms, what they have and haven't done, and why we feel the need uh, to, to pursue uh, strong state legislation on this issue at this point. One thing I just wanna center in on that Rhea had said, um, this is not about eliminating all antibiotic use in farms, right? We wanna make sure that these drugs stay effective for when animals and people truly need them. So Rhea talked about a situation where a, a, a lamb, I think it was, was injured. Um, that's a necessary use, right? So there are situations where if an animal's sick, absolutely, they should be treated with antibiotics. Uh, if they're you know, hurt in some way and, and antibiotics are required, that's an acceptable use. What we have focused on uh, typically is eliminating those preventative uses that Madeline had covered earlier. So situations where it's built into the system that medically important antibiotics are used to prevent diseases that are brought on by the industrial farming conditions these animals are in. Um, and then just to close the loop on what Dr. Patel had said, this is a holistic approach. We already know that there are protocols in place to collect antibiotic use data and, and set reduction targets. There are already reduction targets that have been set for use in human healthcare by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. There's room for improvement there for sure, but we just don't see the same level of accountability and focus when it comes to tracking and reducing antibiotic use in agriculture. That's why we're focused on this space. Um, but it has to be a holistic approach as Dr. Patel had mentioned. These are shared goods, antibiotics are shared goods. Um, that's the first thing. So in terms of what the FDA has and has not done, uh, 
First off, this is not a new problem. We have known about the link between overusing antibiotics on farms and the, the threat to human health since the 1970s. Uh, despite that, the FDA has not really taken significant action on this problem until about 10 years ago. So um, a few things they've done. One is they have taken medically important antibiotics and brought them under veterinary oversight. That's obviously a good step. Um, the other thing they've done is they have taken the growth promotion claim off of antibiotic labels. So now uh, a meat producer theoretically cannot use medically important antibiotics just to make animals grow faster and bigger. Um, uh, again, good in theory. Uh, the problem with these approaches and why we feel it's not enough, one is that the medically important antibiotics, many of those that were approved for promoting growth are still approved for disease prevention and they're used in very much the same way. So we see that kind of misuse continuing. The other problem is that although there was a slight decline in antibiotic sales um, from the FDA's previous efforts, that trend is now being reversed. So when you look at the sales data, which is the only data we have, we have um, sales data for antibiotics, which gives us some good insight into the broader trends. Um, that shows that sales of medically important antibiotics to food producing animals have actually increased by 8% from 2017 through 2021, which is the most recent year of data. So we're heading in the wrong direction is what I'm saying here. Um, so that's the second thing. And then I wanna talk about the state policies that are already out there and, and one we're actively working on. So there are two policies on this issue, um, one in California, one in Maryland that we have worked on with our partners. Um, those two differ slightly, but the, the basic premise is the same in that they primarily restrict the routine use of medically important antibiotics in otherwise healthy animals. So the um, medically important drugs are restricted to when an animal is sick, they should be treated to control a verified disease outbreak or in limited circumstances like what Rhea had described earlier where an animal is injured or, or um, undergoing surgery. So um, that's the first thing. They also did collect some antibiotic use data, particularly in Maryland, that is pretty helpful. And then I just heard um, from our state director in Maryland that the state veterinarian of Maryland was at a hearing uh, recently talking about how important it is to collect that antibiotic use data in Maryland to be able to track use, identify overuse and improve it. So plant that seed for my next point. Um, the bill we're actively working on in Illinois, which was uh, introduced by um, Representative Noreen Hammond uh, in the House and Senator David Kohler in the Senate, and we appreciate their leadership on that. Um, the bill in Illinois would do a couple important things. It's a slightly different approach from the other policies I mentioned. So first off, it would collect antibiotic use data in the form of the veterinary feed directives. So that's basically a prescription so that when a, a producer, a meat producer wants to use medicated feed, which is typically how they use it on large numbers of animals at the same time to prevent disease, they have to get that veterinary feed directive, again, basically like a prescription from the veterinarian. Um, under FDA regulation, feed mills that mix that, um, those antibiotics into the feed have to collect and hold on to those VFDs. So that data exists, it's, it's there. We are asking in this bill, the Department of Agriculture, directing the Department of Agriculture to collect those veterinary feed directives and the associated feed distribution records. Those have really important information, you know, how these drugs are being used, the, the amount of drugs being used. That will give us uh, insight into a really important piece of antibiotic use. Again, it's through the feed, which is actually how about two thirds of the medically important antibiotics used in food animal production are administered. So it's a big chunk of that use. Um, the second thing the bill does is it sets a target for reducing antibiotic use. Um, I actually just got to note that the house sponsor is Norma Hernandez. I apologize, my bad. Um, sorry about that. So uh, the, the second thing is it would set a target for reducing overall antibiotic use on farms. That's key. We have to track the data, but also make it a priority to reduce antibiotic use. So the Department of Agriculture would set a target for reducing use by 50%. That might sound like a lot, but over time, it's absolutely doable. And when we look at the European Union, they um, cut antibiotic use in veterinary settings nearly in half over a, a, a 10 year period. So again, doable. And with that, I will stop. But thank you so much for coming and I'm looking forward to questions.
Great. Thank you, Matt. And thank you to all of our panelists for all of the information that you shared. Um, we will now turn it over to our Q&A portion. Um, and I'll start with um, actually a question for Rhea. Can you share how your customers feel about buying meat raised without antibiotics from you? Because I know you talked about there being demand out there. So we'd love to hear more. Yeah, it's definitely a common question and customers are getting more educated. I mean, we, we've been, our farmers have been doing farmer's markets since um, like 2005 and just awareness in general of people um, in the Chicago area, at least uh, that are purchasing there. It's like they, they're getting better and better at asking the right questions. So it's great to see that. Um, and people usually look look at that, you know, through organic certification, asking the specific question about antibiotics itself. Um, and then um, I don't even, as far as the animal welfare certification too, that, that would probably be another way to, um, to make sure that that's avoided. But um, so yeah, it's definitely, it's important and it's a growing area of concern, but there's only more that could be done there. You know, more consumer awareness would be good. I'm not sure if people realize just how prevalent uh, preventative uh, antibiotic use is, um, so. Great, thank you. And you alluded to this, but I imagine a significant um, piece that needs to be addressed in order to drive more demand for the type of meat that you raise is this public education piece about, you know, how animals can be raised differently and the problem with antibiotic resistance. So I'll open it up to all of the panelists. Um, what opportunities do you see to educate the public about antibiotic resistance and the connection to food? And anyone can feel free to jump in. I guess since I, I, I'm i already unmuted, I'll, I'll go ahead and start. And I, I think that um, events like farm events, farm tours are good. It's not practical all the time for everybody, but when it is possible, it's very powerful to be on the farm itself and to witness how the, the food, how, being that close to your food. And, you know, were you to visit a confinement operation instead or drive by even on a highway <laughs> near a feedlot, you'd see the stark difference and it, it makes it very clear, you know, what, what you need to buy and which kind of farm to support. I can say um, we do a lot of consumer education, especially as part of that coalition that I mentioned earlier, where we work with farmers and physicians on this problem. I think that um, anytime we're pursuing policy uh, or it, when we're talking about corporate policy, so we also urge major meat buyers like fast food companies to change their practices. Um, we make a concerted effort in the media on social media to educate people about antibiotic resistance itself. Like, what does this even mean? But especially about the connection to farms. I think the first thing people tend to think when we bring it up is, oh, that's gross. I don't wanna eat antibiotics in my food, which we know is not really the case. You know, There are protocols in place to make sure antibiotic residues are not in the meat that you're eating. The problem is that when you overuse antibiotics on farms, it breeds drug resistant bacteria that can spread off the farm, get to you and make you sick. So it's important to have that education and make sure folks are very clear on why is this a problem for us um, and what, what can we do about it? Um, absolutely, I agree with what you both said, I guess, kind of, I read um, a report recently from the Environmental Working Group um, where they tested meat um, raw meat in stores for bacteria. And I think they found roughly 75% of the meat was contaminated with antibiotic resistant bacteria. Um, so like Matt said, you know, the concern more is that we see these antibiotic resistant infections within the meat we're eating. And I think it's really important for people to understand you know, in order to protect people from antibiotic resistance, we need to protect animals as well. There's that critical linkage between the two. And 
yeah, in this kind of one health sphere, the environment, animals, people, we really are so interconnected. Great. Um, Samir, do you have anything to add? Yeah, sure. Um, so, you know, I talk to parents uh, all day uh, when I take care of their children and, you know, it's very frustrating and um, upsetting and you feel powerless when your child has an infection, you know, from microbes you can't see and sometimes you don't even know how they got them and you want what's best for them and do what you can to make them better. And um, all parents, you know, when we talk about resistant infections, whether counseling them to prior, you know, let's say they're a patient who's needing surgery or immunocompromised, you talk about prevention or those who've already had it. And then we talk about preventing recurrence. You know, parents want to want that opportunity to make the right decisions for their children. Patients want to make that um, decisions for themselves. And, you know, they ask me, what can we do? And, you know, I say that, you know, we want to use antibiotics when you need them. Um, we don't want to use antibiotics when you have fevers that are due to viruses that don't can't be treated with antibiotics. Um, and sometimes they ask me, like, what can I do in the community to, um, you know, when they're home from the hospital to keep their kids safe? And, you know, and I I remind people that, that you know, we we live in a world where you have to you know, there's some bacterial infections that are spread from soil and air and from animals and and that we have to be vigilant for them. And that when you, um, you know, apart from things, obvious things like hand washing and so forth, that, you know, it's our choices as, as members of the community and consumers that we can, um, you know, support um, measures that help all of us, you know. So I remind them that you have the you have the, um, you, you know, you, it is frustrating when you get infected and it feels that you're powerless, but you have the ability to make choices about um, how we, per, you know, what kind of meat we purchase and what kind of policies that they can advocate for. Can I just say really quickly, Danielle, to, to mm -hmm. Dr. Patel's point about um, spreading through soil. So the United Nations just issued a report like a couple weeks ago highlighting antibiotic resistance in the environment and and talking about how once these these bugs are out there they're out there and they're spreading so just a heads up for the for the attendees that's um increasingly more on um public health organizations radars as it should be thanks for that additional info uh, Matt, I want to come back to you with a clarifying question from our audience about uh, whether there are bills already in state legislatures aimed at addressing these issues. I know you mentioned an Illinois bill, so if you could just restate that and then share if there are any others in the works. Absolutely. So um, the bill, the only bill we're actively working on right now is the Illinois legislation. And if folks are um, interested in, in checking it out, it's uh, 3567 in the House is the, the bill number and in the Senate it's 1891. With that said, I know that there has been legislation in New York on this issue. I'm not sure if it's up again um, this year, <laughs> excuse me, but um, we are absolutely open to working with folks in other states uh, on, on legislation to improve antibiotic stewardship. So, and the name of the Illinois bill is the Transparent and Responsible Antibiotic Use Act. But again, we're, we're absolutely open to working with other um, folks in, in state legislatures to come up with policy solutions on this problem. And uh, feel free to reach out to me if you'd like to do that. My email is mwellington at perg.org. And I'll put that in the um, follow-up email as well to RSVPs after this. Great. Uh, and while we are on the topic of policy, uh, I know we've heard some policy solutions mentioned, and then Madeline also alluded to some market-based solutions. So uh, this is a question for all of the panelists. What policy or market-based solutions would you recommend to reduce antibiotic overuse in animal agriculture? I would draw attention again to the fact that cattle and sheep are herbivores and they need to be eating green leafy 
um, grass, pasture plants, and hay, and not um, grains, which are sub subsidized. And you know, most of in Illinois, most of farmland is corn and beans, and most of this is going to livestock, most of which shouldn't be eating it because again, they're herbivores and it's just, it's it's bad for our land. It has the wrong fat components, omega-6 instead of omega-3 that comes in the meat after they eat grain. And then um, the environmental impact, the health impact, the animals then potentially having more health problems and needing more antibiotics. It's just a spiraling problem in our um, food and agriculture system that um, instead of being addressed, it's subsidized on the government level. So, you know, I just really like to bring attention to that. I'd like to pile on to Ray's comment. So totally seconded. And then I would just say, we talk a lot about the health impacts of this issue and, and how this is to preserve antibiotics for people and animals. But the other um, thing I talk about is how this is really to try to level the playing field in some respects for farmers who do not overuse antibiotics already, right? Rhea talked about some of the challenges earlier um, with having a farm that operates in that way. And the more that we subsidize and and um, allow antibiotic misuse in, oh, geez, my video's freaking out. Sorry, turned off for just a sec. The more we subsidize and, and allow misuse of antibiotics on farms, um, that playing field is is not level with with local producers. So that's the other, important part of these policies that we don't often put as the the top thing, um, but it's it's right there as well. Thank you. Um, Madeline or Dr. Patel, do either of you want to add to that? Sure. I'll, I mean, echo some of the points that Matt had brought up in his intro, but I think in terms of policy recommendations, also, we would like the federal government to establish national targets for reducing antibiotic use in animal agriculture. You know, targets create accountability and would really hold the industry to a standard that would foster change in operational practices. So over time, producers can rely less and less on antibiotics. And then as well, we really need a federal program to systematically collect species specific data on why farms use antibiotics and in what amounts. Um, like Matt said, and what we're trying to do in Illinois, you know, there is right now very little transparency or accountability from the livestock industry regarding how much antibiotics are being used and for what purpose. And, and without an ability to track antibiotic use, um, progress to reduce antibiotic overuse is totally hampered. I would just say, even though we're pursuing state policy, we would also very much love to see federal action. So the reason we're pursuing state policy is because the federal folks are moving too slowly, but we would exactly. absolutely love to see it happen at the federal level, just like Madeline. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's an important point, especially since so many animals are transported from one state to the next, um, just throughout the meat industry. And so having those protections in place uh, federally and in, in, in multiple states is critical. Um, okay, well, we will move to our next question. Um, Dr. Patel, one of the things that has come up is just, you know, there's antibiotic overuse, not just in uh, animal agriculture, but also in the human healthcare system. Um, can you share why antibiotic stewardship in human healthcare is necessary and what challenges you see um, with just antibiotic use in humans? Yeah, sure. So um, um, when someone has a fever or is, has a suspected infection. Um, historically, when antibiotics were first new, it was so amazing to be able to treat a pneumonia, which, you know, 150 years ago would have, 100 years ago would have had a high risk of death. Um, and that we um, had this almost like this, these super powered medications 
that rendered um, so many illnesses treatable. So you know, if you you know imagine um, you know read any novel written before 1900 or <laughs> earlier, like, you know, like if someone has like five children, one of them you know may have passed away, or you know this is a common experience for a lot of illnesses to to lead to um, infectious illness to lead to premature death. Um, so we were very lulled into a sense that that you know we can use these medicines to, to save a lot of lives, and they and they do, and they still do. Um, and we just want to make sure they keep on doing it. And I think that, that the inertia and in the medical system initially was not really realizing that how much harm is coming uh, in addition to this benefit and that, that we can tweak and that we can ju judiciously move to an equilibrium where we are maximizing benefit and minimizing harm. Um, so like, you know, when you think of using a medicine for any condition, you know, you think of, okay, well, the doctor gives you you know, this medicine to treat your headache, and there's a small chance that you might get stomach pain or an ulcer and so forth. And then, you know, we sort of track that and say, okay, you know, for most patients, it works, but if you have side effects, you should, you should pull back or certain patients we shouldn't use. You know, for the longest time, we didn't consider resistance in, in medicine as that important side effect that we had to keep track of. Uh, and, and then we were seeing infections in our hospitals and our communities, spreading for between patients who weren't even between children and adults who weren't even in the hospital. Um, and that, you know, uh, and then we, we just saw all the positive and not, we weren't keeping track of the downside of that and to, to arrive at that balanced use of it. And, and then by, by using that, you know, by treating infections that are there, but not overusing antibiotics, not treating patients too long on antibiotic regimens, using overly powerful antibiotics when we don't need them, that was just contributing to uh, to resistance. Um, it's stewardship, uh, the idea of antimicrobial stewardship, monitoring antibiotic use, promoting judicious use is a federal mandate. So, you, you know, hospitals don't get funding from Medicare or Medicaid unless they demonstrate that they have a plan to deal with this. You know, this, this is an established part now of our healthcare system. This is a recommendation that every professional health society in the world um, recommends. So, and so there are people like me at all hospitals um, working on this to, to, to some degree. Um, and, you know, it's, there isn't, sometimes there isn't an easy solution and sometimes it takes a while to get where we want to be. But by seeing the data on our use, by working with our, our doctor colleagues to say, listen, you know, your patients will do just as fine with this antibiotic or no antibiotics versus this powerful antibiotic, we are slowly um, changing. Great, thank you so much. Um, and as we head into our final few questions here, I just wanna remind people to use the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. Uh, if you do have a question, we will work it in. Um, Rhea, this question is for you. Another angle that we see on this problem and in this discussion is the animal welfare piece and the, the concerns about animal welfare. Um, can you share about the connection between animal welfare and antibiotic use? Yes, and I think Madeline already explained it and alluded to it a bit, but just adding to that, you know, if an animal is needing prophylactic, uh, prophylactic an antibiotics or, you know, take they're either in the feed, they're just having them all the time, like that if the animal needs that, that means that's not a happy, healthy animal. And it's not in conditions that it should be in. It should be completely unnecessary for an animal that is in good conditions and has good health. Um, and, you know, like we're having a renaissance looking at uh, gut, the gut biome, and that's the same thing with animals. And if you if you um, if you kill all the healthy bacteria in their gut, you know it um, on so many levels affects their health and happiness. And as a meat eater myself, who loves animals and spends as much time as I can possible with them, like I want their living lives to be as good as they can be and as happy as they can be. So it's really important that that they be healthy. And and I. To me, that's what animal welfare is, is all about. Can I chime in on something Dr. Patel had said earlier? Um, so when it comes to 
making sure the accountability of human health care and antibiotic use is equal to the accountability in agriculture. I actually want to read a recent statement from the FDA. So this is from a Vox article from last month. Um, an FDA spokesperson said specific reduction targets for antibiotic use weren't possible because the agency doesn't know how many antibiotics farmers are using. And the FDA's quote, we cannot effectively monitor antimicrobial use without first putting a system in place for determining a baseline and assessing trends over time. So whereas Dr. Patel said it's mandated that hospitals who want to participate, and I think you said Medicaid and Medicare, they have to track antibiotic use and have a plan for reducing it. That does not exist in animal agriculture. So before I forgot, I wanted to make sure I flagged and read that out because I think it's important. Great. Um, thanks for clarifying that and, and adding to Dr. Patel's point. Um, I want to just jump off of that and uh, Matt, we'll start with you. Where do you think antibiotics policies currently fall short? Uh, I think I, I mostly mentioned where I think it does, but I'll reiterate some of that. So I think there's a couple approaches. There are different ways to get at the same result, right? We feel that the biggest problem is this continued prophylactic use of antibiotics to compensate for industrial farming conditions. So basically just using antibiotics on animals that are otherwise healthy, because you know, based on the conditions they're in, they're likely to get sick. We would like to, to phase that that use out, which we can do, as has already been mentioned, through management practices, through better diets, more appropriate diets. Um, there are ways to do this. The chicken industry has already figured it out. Um, and now upwards of 90% by industry data of the chicken industry uh, is no longer using medically important antibiotics routinely. So we have those examples. The other um, problem again is that we have no, we, we have sales data on antibiotics federally and that gives us some good trends, but we don't know exactly how antibiotics are being used for different purposes. And so we can't pinpoint and track and hold producers accountable to antibiotic stewardship. Um, so we need to collect better data and we need to have those reduction targets because if we don't have it, then we have no way of knowing how these drugs are being used on farms and if what the you know little steps the FDA has taken are effective um, on that front. So those are the, the two things where I think it falls short. Thanks. Uh, Madeline, do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, I would add um, kind of an additional piece is, you know, we know from human and animal medicine as well that the longer that antibiotics are used, the greater the risk that the bacteria will develop resistance to them. And, you know, under current FDA regulations, about a third of medically important antibiotics sold for use in animal feed or drinking water have no labels with a stated duration or time limit for how long they can be given to flocks or herds. So this means they can be used for the whole time an animal is on a farm or a feedlot. So that's another piece that um, kind of along with kind of eliminating those preventive uses also kind of shortening then the durations of use on those antibiotics as well, because those long durations are contributing to the overuse and then subsequent antibiotic resistant infections. I'd love to chime in, or excuse me, chime in, <laughs> um, and, and, and also bring up, so there's limitations and um, restrictions, but on more of a promoting what we wanna see way too, I, livestock farmers on the small and medium scale are, struggling and the bigger ones too like I'm sure a lot of the the reasons they have the setup they are is they're under so much financial pressure so what ways can can we um, incentivize and reward uh, the livestock producers that are avoiding antibiotic overuse and that are prioritizing animal welfare environmental and human health all at once and I think that's a there's just so much room for improvement there um, you know, whether whether there was some kind of uh, incentive or reward or insurance that would help back up farmers. Like it's not it's not easy to be a livestock farmer. You usually have to have an off-farm job 
And it's usually very hard to scale to a point um, where you can grow and, and not have to do that. Uh, many farmers give up raising animals because they're so expensive and it's so hard to make the, the numbers work. So there, there's a big need for support. Can I ask you, Rhea, what would that look like from your end? Because this is actually something PERC has been trying to pursue and put together. We've had a couple meetings with folks and, and haven't come up with a good concrete you know, policy or program. Um, what would that look, what would you want that to look like? Well, something that just kind of, I, I'm no expert on this, but something I've seen work really well at the farmer's market is the EBT SNAP food um, stamps programs. Like if there was some way that, to use that sort of paradigm where it's like, so some of the, you get some of the coupons that are only good for vegetables or like that sort of thing. Would there be a way to do it within um, food stamps where it, 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 like there was an extra amount you got to purchase from an animal welfare approved farm? Um, or even uh, what if there was a tax, what if you could get a tax credit for um, spending a certain amount on, <laughs> animal I don't know if that's at all practical probably not I'm just brainstorming but um just any any way that could be worked in or like crop insurance is what um subsidize subsidizes a lot of the corn farms but then the, the cattle are eating the corn um which isn't healthy for them so if if there's um, more support and risk mitigation uh, and, and um, financially a net for farmers that are doing a pasture-based system. Pasture insurance is still much less money per acre um, and that incentivizes farmers to plow their, their fields up and plant corn. So um, that's, that's a piece that could really be better addressed here. I don't know how helpful that is. Again, just random kind of brainstorming no, after I think it's, being in the field for a while. <laughs> yeah, I think it's super helpful. And we should, you know, of course, follow up offline about it. But the crop insurance comparison is an interesting one. So yeah, we'll we'll be in touch with you about that. Great. Yeah, thank you, Raya, for those ideas. Uh, and that actually segues nicely into the final question we will get to today. Um, with this being a farm bill year, there are many marker bills or are there any marker bills we should encourage our leg legislators to get behind in order to support humane farmers and reduce the use of antibiotics in livestock and poultry? Uh, and I will open that up to all the panelists, but Madeline, I'll start with you. Do you have thoughts on that? Um, yeah, I think we definitely um, would like to see a marker bill that can more support humane farmers and reduce the overuse of antibiotics. You know, I think I'll kind of turn it over to Matt to talk more specifics, but I think we'd like to see a marker bill, but I'm not really aware of too much right now. Yeah, I would just say um, in terms of bills on this issue, there's there's no, there has not been an active piece of legislation federally on antibiotic use in agriculture for several years. The previous legislation was the Preservation of Medical Antibiotics for Medical Treatment Act on the House side, which was championed by Representative Slaughter. Um, she unfortunately passed away and it has not been taken up again by any offices. On the Senate side, uh, it was the Preventing Antibiotic Resistance Act. Similarly, has not been taken up again um, since I think 2017. So it's high time that a federal um, you know, representative, a Congress member takes this issue on as a priority and, and introduces a bill on it so that we can start raising visibility and, and pushing for action. Um, we are actively reaching out to offices on, on that front. So um, definitely encourage any of the folks who are on the federal side on this call. And I know we have um, some other folks who weren't able to make the call, but we'll get this recording to So for them, um, again, feel free to reach out to me if they're interested in pursuing that, because uh, that's an important, it's an important thing. We, we Right now, that space is totally absent. Um, yeah. Great. Well, we are coming up to the end of our time here. So I wanna thank all of the panelists so much for joining and sharing your different perspectives and expertise on this important issue. Uh, and I just wanna leave the audience uh, with 
an important fact to just help us, you know, remember how urgent this issue is. Without moving quickly to reduce antibiotic use, drug-resistant infections are slated to kill more people worldwide by 2050 every year than cancer kills today, uh, which is 10 million a year. So that's pretty serious growth that we're looking at in antibiotic-resistant infections uh, that become deadly. And you know, with all of the lack of federal action on this issue, state action will be key. So we are very grateful to all of our um, state level uh, folks who got on the webinar today to learn more. And we look forward to staying in touch. Uh, like Matt mentioned, you can get in touch with him uh, via email. Um, and I'm seeing a question now. Yes, this recording will be shared out afterwards for folks to pass along to anyone else they think would be interested. Uh, so thank you all again so much for coming and thank you to our panelists for participating.